Okay, let's kick off. So welcome to today's webinar, the economic road ahead in the financial year playbook for 21-22. Um, a huge amount of work has gone into this um, from not just the people you're about to hear from today, our fantastic speakers uh, and con producers, um, but also from the Creditor Watch uh, marketing and communications team. So a huge shout out to them. Um, they've worked tirelessly on this. It certainly isn't an easy thing to put together, particularly when dealing with someone like me who likes to do everything at the last minute. They're very patient with me, so thank you for that. And now I'm going to welcome Ali Kane to join us. Ali, if you just want to pop your uh, your video on, plenty of what? you would be would be familiar with Ali. It's great to have you on again. And um, Ali's done a huge amount of the legwork here, not just for the webinar itself, and she's about to work even harder over the next sort of 30 to 45 minutes, but uh, also in the the playbook itself, which if you haven't downloaded course you should jump on to the website and download it ASAP we, we will have um, links for you later on so Ali over to you we did have some things about Creditor Watch highlights but you know what let's just uh, get straight into um, the webinar itself and I'll flick over to the next one from here well, uh, good morning, everybody. If I could ask um, all our esteemed panel to turn their cameras on, I will introduce you uh, in a moment. So as Patrick introduced you, my name's Ali Kane. I'm a freelance finance journalist and I'll be your host uh, for the webinar today. And I wanna start by saying, I hope that everybody is doing okay uh, in lockdowns, as they say, this too shall pass. But lockdowns and the uh, Delta strain notwithstanding, we certainly seem to be at a turning point for the Australian economy. After successfully negotiating 2020, we're now battling fresh COVID outbreaks, a very slow vaccination rollout, and absolutely no insight into when our borders will be open. Yet only a few short weeks ago, we thought we were going to be in a much better position than we are in now. So today I'm joined by an esteemed panel of business and economic experts who all contributed to the Creditor Watch Economic Road Ahead and a financial year playbook for 2021-2022. And this webinar is an opportunity for all our experts to reflect on the year that was and talk through the potential for the year ahead. So introducing our panel today, um, of course, we have um, Patrick Coglin, who is the CEO of Creditor Watch. We're also joined by Nerida Connorsby, who's the Chief Economist from Ray White, Chris Little, who's the CEO of Coface, and Jeanette Mueller, who's a partner with Paul Chadwick. So welcome everybody this morning and thanks so much uh, for being a part of today. A little bit of housekeeping for everybody before um, we get cracking in earnest. Please feel free to post any questions and we will endeavour to answer them um, as we go ahead. So first let's have a look at some of the insights from the report itself. So Patrick, I'll start with you. Tricky question, where is the economy at at the moment? So look, I've mentioned this a couple of times over the last 16 months or so in that every time we produce a report, um, a piece of content, um, it seems that the economy and the pandemic shifts underneath us. You know, three weeks ago, four weeks ago, however long ago it was, late, late, late June, um, everything was was uh, rocking along really nicely. You know, consumer confidence was up, commercial confidence was up, credit inquiries were up, people were looking or companies and, and directors were looking to trade with one another. They were looking to assess credit. They were increasing credit limits. Um, everything was looking really rosy. And then obviously we have been sideswiped, um, particularly here in New South Wales, which is which is then, um, uh, you know, been rolled out to the rest of the uh, the country basically um, and and we find ourselves back in essentially June July this time last year when when Victoria experienced their extended lockdown so there's a lot of question marks out there we've got a we've got a bit of a survey going on at the moment um, to our customers uh, Mitchie our GM of comms and marketing will probably be rolling her eyes saying stop talking about 
the results. We haven't even finished the survey yet, but the one big result is that people just want clarity. They want to understand what is happening. You know, even if it's a case of, hey, we're in this for, you know, another 12 months until, you know, we get to an 80% vaccination rate. At least they know and they can plan because, you know, business owners, managers, um, essentially, it's very difficult for them to invest in whether it's people or technology or goods or product, whatever it is, it's, it's really hard to do. Um, and, and, and that is probably the, the, the word at the moment that's being used a lot is the uncertainty that is out there. Nerida, if I can move to you, uh, have we got any insights yet into how the current lockdowns are likely to impact economic performance for the rest of the year? Yeah, look, we're certainly moving into uh, very different conditions as Patrick stated. I think the big thing though is we are, you know, the economy was very different leading into this. So uh, it was a lot stronger, um, unemployment was very low, uh, we've got a vaccine. So I think that's probably the key thing that, you know, there is a way out. And I think if we look at Victoria last year, there was no way out. And, you know, people felt very stressed because of that. But, you know, this time I don't think I don't think this will break the, break the recovery. Um, it will certainly slow it down. Um, but, you know, I think circumstances, not just in Australia, but also globally, point to continued uh, strong conditions, uh, provided we get out of this in a, in a reasonable time frame. You know, I think it'll be quite different if we are here until September compared, or October compared to if we get out of this in, a, in around mid-August or towards the end of August. Um, Chris, I've just seen the headlines from uh, today's New South Wales press conference and as I understand it, New South Wales has been declared a, a national emergency. Do you think that the state is facing a national emergency in terms of its economic and, and health recovery? That's an excellent question. So, uh, you know, I concur with what the previous panellists have said. So it's it really going to come down to how long the lockdown goes for. So as we've discussed, you know, obviously I'm based in Melbourne, so obviously we had our 112 day lockdown last year. So it does have a significant impact mentally uh, on, on the people in it. So in terms of the economics of New South Wales, obviously you know, New South Wales government has taken a, an even bigger step than we did down here in as much as that they've closed down construction as well. So that's sort of unprecedented in this in this market. So you know, we've got the roadmap out, it's the vaccination, so that that's the plan. Uh, in terms of, you know, will this turn into an emergency? That's really going to come down to you know, how long it how long it lasts and also what the government response would be in, in a, in a long-term environment. Obviously, up to now, we, you know, last year we had the, the JobKeeper and JobSeeker processes in place, um, which obviously supported all spectrums of business and individuals. So. You know, obviously there there is a there is a matrix there uh, that you know government could reintroduce to support business going forward. But obviously there's there's always a balancing act of you know how much debt the government wants to take on uh, and and what's best for the economy. So you know a long way of saying you know hard to know at this stage, but obviously based on how long it goes for and what government support there will be. Jeanette, you're right at the coalface. What are you seeing among your clients? How are they feeling about the future? Well, look, put really simply, if we sort of cast our mind back, 2021 for, for insolvency has probably been the worst since the 1990s, which is probably music to a lot of people's ears. But certainly for liquidators and bankruptcy trustees, it's been an anis horribilis. Um, businesses have obviously closed in the last 12 months. So why were the number of formal insolvency last year only 50% of the five year running average? That's sort of a, a bit of a conundrum, but clearly companies have not felt the need to enter into formal external administration. And we know that some of the most obvious reasons for companies in distress not entering into liquidation relate to this change in the debtor creditor relationships brought on by COVID-19, including more lenience and leniency shown by the tax office in terms of deferrals and payment arrangements, banking relaxations, including interest holidays. And, you know, it's been reported that certain financiers have taken the view that where real property secures the debt, they will not take possession of the property. 
as there's currently no urgency while property prices are rising and interest rates are at historic lows. And you combine this with the recent memory of the Banking Royal Commission and it's easy to see why there is currently no appetite for a firmer response. Other creditors have reported a preparedness to allow customers to pay off their outstanding debt over six to 12 months, even some you know, allowing the return of stock without penalty. So generally these type of changes point to a high level of communication between debtors and creditors. And this higher than usual tolerance in debtor-creditor relationships combined with record levels of government grants, subsidies and hardship discounts have enabled companies to avoid formal administration. So companies have been able to orchestrate orderly informal wind downs and or circumstances have been such that their companies can either lay dormant or deregister without creditors pursuing them into formal liquidation. So in terms of how long will this seismic relationship shift between creditors, debtors be the new normal, it's pretty difficult to say. I mean, earlier this year, the tax office indicated that they would harden their stance in debt collection by the end of this calendar year. Uh, but this was before the latest lockdowns in New South Wales, South Australia and Victoria. So it's quite likely that in view of the current state of play, we can expect to see more of the same in terms of a drop in insolvency numbers. And I wouldn't be surprised if we have another year of historic low levels and in insolvency appointments. It's pretty much my prediction for 2022. Thanks, Jeanette. So Patrick, we're talking about um, trade payments numbers now, so we may as well get into the crux of that. Um, it's very difficult for you to get a picture on what's happening because the landscape has changed so much given lockdowns. How do you expect lockdowns, if you're going to have a look into your crystal ball, to affect payment times for the rest of the year? Yeah, it's a good question. And, you know, we've seen payment time sort of go up and down, you know, on, on a whole over the last, you know, over the COVID period. And, and they started to, to look really positive um, through the first half of, of this year. Um, what we've also started to do is release um, a, what we call a probability of default um, within an industry. And, and I think the obvious one in June, and this was, remember, this is all pre, essentially pre uh, lockdown was um, hospitality was already, you know, the riskiest one. And then you had um, the other big ones like retail and construction sitting at sort of five and six. And now I would be suggesting that they will probably be the top three and, and Chris, you can you could nod or or uh, or uh, shake your head, <laughs> but you know you, you're at the, the cold face there, being a um, a trade credit insurer. Um, so I, I think you know the challenge the challenges we see around this are it happens very quickly. So you know our report went the last report went to went to June. Um, you then net see people essentially close their their wallets immediately and stop paying everyone because they go, how long is this going to last for? That was certainly the, the the experience back in you know March, April. I don't think that will necessarily happen this time. Um, there's there's no government uh, direct liquidity as a result of this lockdown hitting until next week, I believe, or it's just started, and it's certainly a lot less than than the job keeper, job seeker that was around last year. So uh, we anticipate to see. Um, payment times increase and the probability of the default increase significantly for any industry that, that relies on foot traffic. So the obvious, obvious ones there, retail and, and hospitality, you know, food, beverage, restaurants, that sort of thing. Um, construction, of course, is, is you know, I, I sort of feel for hospitality and co because all of this attention's come to, um, you know, construction, they get shut down for two weeks and, and you know, retail and hospitality have been shut down for 10 months. <laughs> in the last 16 so um you know they'll certainly shoot up there and there's there's traditionally payment problems in that space anyway between um between you know contractors subcontractors and, and anyone else in that supply chain um and then you'll see you know the likes of um couriers and transportation as well get hit again um so that's probably the, the sort of top four industries that that are really at risk and, and again, the length of time that this lockdown continues, I mean, let's be honest, I don't see us going back to the office until September with the latest numbers and, and you know, emergencies being declared. So it's going to put a, a huge amount of pressure on, on small businesses in particular, because they typically have, you know, sort of, I don't know, two, two weeks to, to two months worth of uh, savings that would have been dwindled over the last 16 months and, and would have been eaten too. 
over the last four weeks. Um, yeah, there'll be pressure on the government as well to, to reintroduce JobKeeper or uh, Scotty from marketing hopefully comes up with a new uh, a new uh, catchphrase for, for whatever stimulus package he releases. Patrick, how much of a problem is it that con construction is shut down? Um, I'll be selfish really quickly and then I'll answer a, uh, a question. We, we're, we're due to move into a new office in Sydney. So that's been, that's delayed delayed us, which is which is disappointing. But look, it's, it's a, just a massive problem, I think, for, for construction and, and hospitality is very similar, but construction in particular, they, they, they got 20, 48 hours of notice, you know, um, not to say that it's easier to shut a restaurant or a cafe, but, um, you know, you've got all your everything on site and, and to slow to, to slow that to a stop is really difficult. And then to start it back up is also extremely difficult. Um, and and the, the the support measures in place, you know, I think it's uh, correct me if I'm wrong, up to forty percent of payroll, but capped at ten thousand dollars. Uh, it just doesn't touch sides at the end of the day. And and businesses, it doesn't matter if they're big or small, you know, they're going to be they're they're either laying people off um, or they're they're um, putting them on on stand down. The the challenge for them is though. They've got so many jobs out there that they, they don't want to lay people off because then they've got to try to hire them again and there's costs and challenges with that. So how long does this construction in particular um, lockdown continue for? Hopefully only till the end of next week, but I guess, you know, everything's a movable feast at the moment, isn't it? That's right. That's right. So Narada, you have insight into what's happening in the property market. Um, over the last few weeks where New South Wales and then other states have been placed into lockdown, how's that affected the property market in the short term? Yeah, look, definitely uh, the number of properties for sale has come down. You know, we can, we can see that people are holding off decision making and, um, you know, just waiting and watching, you know, the properties that were on market, we, we haven't seen withdrawals as yet. So, you know, I think that that's quite interesting that people are, are, are holding as opposed to pulling out of the market um, in, in their entirety. Um, how things, how things been, you know, it's, a, it's an unusual one, you know, it's certainly been very unusual through, through this um, whole pandemic in that it has performed incredibly well. House prices across Australia are up 15% over a 12 month time period. Uh, it, it has, um, you know, in some ways lockdowns is, is quite good for pricing because people save more money and, you know, they're not spending at hospitality, they're not travelling as much, you know. So, so when you have a look at what happened to the household savings rate last year, it, you know, it got to its highest level ever recorded and, and almost tripled. So, you know, there's this incredible, um, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm in lockdown now, I'm not spending anything. So, you know, it, it's, it's not, it's pretty consistent that that's what happened. Uh, it's also unusual that um, the, the, the nature of the recession last year was unusual too, because it wasn't a financial recession. You know, there was plenty of cash and the Reserve Bank cut rates and were pumping the economy full of money. And um, and that that led, you know, that was part of why we, we, we saw such incredible price growth uh, across Australia. So, um, so yeah, for property, uh, and the other thing too that, that ha did happen and which will happen again is that, uh, the pandemic, you know, the, the virus affects our older people, you know, much worse in terms of health and mortality, but it overwhelmingly hits younger people uh, in terms of their economic welfare. And, you know, we saw that in terms of rising youth unemployment. So what that means is that rental markets are the ones that really struggle and, you know, tenants, if you're in hospitality, you can't pay your rent. And so, you know, that leads to rental declines, it leads to higher vacancies. Um, it's very unit specific. We know we don't have foreign students. Um, it's not impacting houses so much, housing rents are holding up. So, you know, there's this, there's a lot of things that are um, unusual, I guess, in terms of, of what's happening at the moment in property and, you know, this, this red hot price growth, which probably, you know, I don't think this will really make much of a dent on it. Um, compared to, you know, what, what was happening with rental growth. Um, what about in commercial property? Do these sorts of lockdowns have an impact on demand for commercial property? And, and what impact on, does it have on property prices? Yeah, look, again, commercial property is, is super unusual on, on the tenant side, terrible. You know, if you go to Melbourne CBD, end of last year, we, you know, we, we had this terrible problem with retail vacancy. 
uh, at, we had a, you know, hardly anyone was in the office, you know, you weren't really allowed to go in the office. Happening in Sydney at the moment, um, people have readjusted their expectations as to how much space they require. You know, more people are working from home. Um, you know, there's been quite dramatic changes to, to how people are working. Uh, when we have a look at industrial though, you know, industrial is having a bumper time. You know, it's, it, people are, you know, buying online more and um, that's requiring more, um, you know, bigger warehousing. It's requiring a lot more last mile um, warehousing as well. So, you know, it's pretty much across the spectrum, no matter what sort of space that you're looking at. Um, so, you know, retail and office, you know, really hit hard from the tenant side, industrial, you know, doing, doing pretty well. Um, but pricing, you know, just, holding up you know again coming back to this very unusual situation that this isn't a financial crisis and we have it there's a ton of cash out there and uh, when we have a look at global capital flows into Australia targeting commercial property it's at record highs and um, Australia because we you know we, we've come through this recession or we've come through the pandemic in, in a vastly different economic um, circumstance to the rest of the world is, is making our, um, our our property look our commercial property look even more attractive uh, that could change you know I, I think the big thing now one of the real challenges at the moment is um, Australia you know that fortress Australia is, is increasingly problematic on one hand it did keep us safe and it made sense but now the rest of the world is, is opening back up and people are moving around and travel started up again. And it, it's going to make us look as an outlier and eventually it will cut into economic growth. I mean, you can't stop migration completely like we have now over a prolonged period without having a, a pretty major hit on in terms of, of how our economy goes. Um, now, Nerida, we do have a question from the audience for you. So thank you very much for sending um, the couple of questions that we've got through. Um, do you expect interest rates to rise and what impact is that going to have on consumer confidence? Yeah, so I guess everyone's watching the inflation figure very closely next week. It, it, there is an expectation that it will get at least to the 2 to 3% um, uh, gap of um, you know, the two, between two and three percent, which is the level at which um, the Reserve Bank aims for. You know, they they do try and keep the the uh, the inflation rate at between two and three uh, percent. It may go over as well. So you know, I th there there is um, an expectation that inflation will will start to climb, and we're seeing it climbing at the moment overseas. You know, in the US, we saw that five percent inflation figure, which you know was historically incredibly high. So um, so it is increasing. I mean, there's a, a few reasons why it's increasing. I mean, part of it is because the economy is just roaring ahead and, uh, or, you know, at least was and on, on latest figures up until the end of June. So, you know, that's a big factor. Uh, unemployment is coming down a lot quicker than expected. So again, potentially this will, this will change as a result of this lockdown, but it's now at 4.9%, which, um, you know, the Reserve Bank didn't expect it to get to that level until December this year. Um, so, so, you know, there's, there's a lot happening which um, is likely to impact the Reserve Bank's decision and as to how quickly they move on, on interest rates. At the moment, they are sticking to a 2024 uh, date at which they'll start to move. Um, we, we have started to see banks creep up mortgage rates a little bit, you know, and I think that, um, at least for housing, that's quite an interesting occurrence because that will slow things down. You know, ultimately, whatever happens to the cash rate does flow directly through to mortgage rates, but banks can obviously move earlier as well. So, um, so you know, that, that will have an impact on housing. Uh, in terms of confidence, you know, I think it's one thing if the Reserve Bank increased interest rates once, but if it really starts to climb very quickly and we start to see several months of increases or you know, not just going up at a 0.25, but at a 0.5 over a month. You know, I think that has has quite a, a dramatic difference. And the and the other challenge too, of course, is government debt is is hit, is set to hit one trillion dollars by 2025. So you know, the Reserve Bank are independent, obviously, but uh, there, there's no doubt that will be some government pressure to try and keep interest rates as low as possible, primarily because not only are Australians in you know pretty high debt situations, they've also got government as well. Mm. You know, um, it, whatever they do will be extremely well signalled to the market and no one will be shocked when they do move the cash rate. 
Um, one, one more um, comment uh, from another audience member. Both my husband and I work in construction and the effects have been um, immediate. So Chris, turning to you, um, being in Victoria, you've obviously um, lived through that 100 plus day lockdown last year. What's your advice for people in other states now coping with lockdowns for surviving through these sorts of tough periods? Um, survival question. Uh, obviously, so yeah, we had we had the 112 day. We had the this is our this is what we call lockdown 5.0. So obviously, you had the the two last year, and this is our third one this year. So uh, one suggestion would be not to have four teenage kids at home, which unfortunately <laughs> I do. So that makes it extremely difficult. So they're they're all being quiet at the moment. But apologies if you hear some screaming in the background. So. In terms of, you know, just using my own experience and you know, the work people as well, you know, I think there's a natural advantage if you do have a house as, a, as opposed to, a, you know, a third story flat or something. I think that the people, are, you know, our staff have really, the people that have really struggled have been in that confined space. So, you know, I think a lot of it comes down to communication. So we tried to be really communicative with our, you know, our team last year constantly getting on video calls and, and phone calls and you know, having fun sessions on Fridays like quizzes and you know, catching up for a drink, that kind of thing. So trying to make it as normal as possible and, and keep in touch with um, staff. From a, from a work perspective, obviously it's, it's a different world. Um, I know I work at a different pace and a different manner from home. So like a lot of people, you, you, know, you tend to stay up later, uh, get up a bit later, uh, you're not traveling and then you know, work you know, not as not as consistently through the day. When, when I'm in the office, it's, it's more like, you know, like everyone, you know, you start, you get to the office at 8.30, all of a sudden it's 12 o'clock and you haven't left your desk. Where at home, there's the, the distractions of kids and noise and all the like. So just, you know, so building that into your day, um, but keeping on top of work and communicating with everyone, uh, just checking in on your staff, but also taking care of your own mental health as well. So making sure, you know, you're, you're getting enough sleep, you're, you know, you're, you know, when you can get your one hour's exercise a day, your legal exercise outside the outside your house, making sure you utilise that, you know, walk, walking the dog, that kind of thing, and just you know, keeping in touch with your, your fellow humans who are going through the same experience. Good advice. Um, Jeanette, we were talking about insolvencies before, and obviously I think this latest period is going to put a lot of pressure on businesses that might already be, you know, semi in trouble. What's your advice to a business that um, might be in, in trouble during this period? Well, it's uh, as it always has been, doesn't change over the years. It's, you know, get good, solid, proper advice, get it early, get it from someone reputable. Um, you know, don't fall for, for any cons, the, the, the usual story. Um, someone who's uh, been a bankrupt doesn't necessarily mean they've got good experience in giving you bankruptcy advice. That would be, that's, that's, that's one I've heard recently. Um, you know, uh, usually can you check they've got some insurance, some professional indemnity insurance? Can you check that they've, you know, perhaps got some uh, qualifications for a professional body? So if they give you the wrong advice and you end up at the uh, receiving end of, a, of, of ASIC or AFSA that, that you've got someone to lean on to say, well, you know, um, I, I went and sought appropriate and 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 trustworthy advice, and um, this is what they told me, etc. I think I think that's the the best thing to do. Um, you know, uh, just really get advice, and you know, um, obviously, you know, seek some turnaround advice as soon as you possibly can if you're in that in in that situation as well. Patrick, um, you've got a question for Chris. Yes, yes, thank you, Chris. I just wanted to jump in. Has given the the speed at which obviously Sydney's gone into lockdown and then um, and then you know Victoria as well um, has followed and the construction shutdown. Are you are you guys seeing anything from a from a claims perspective or a or an increase in in payment times specifically to you know certain industries? What what, what are you guys seeing at, at Coface as a result of it? Yeah, that's yeah. So so obviously we, we do see a lot of age data trial balances either as proposal or from our own clients as part of the renewal process. So I suppose, I suppose my first comment would be that yeah, they have been almost unprecedentedly strong over the last 12 months. So 
speaking to you know, clients and our external stakeholders, brokers and the like, you know, you know, the, the common comment is that you know the HDEV trial balance is in a really good position. So that's been a you know probably an unusual, unexpected theme of the, of the of the COVID crisis. Um, in terms of claims, and and this comment relates to both local and our, and our regional hub and global hub. In, in in the COFAS world, it's 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 benign the claims environment. So if you look at every market, it's it's incredibly low and. In my 15 years at the company, this is probably one of the lowest claims year we've had so far. Obviously, that this is so far. We have seen um, in the last couple of weeks we have seen a slight deterioration in terms of you know the HDO trial balances we're seeing. You know some increases on payments and also a small increase in the claims or the notifications that we are receiving. Um, so seeing those, you know, across different sectors, um, a bit in construction and in, and in solar, um, and and some of it, and a bit more in domestic as well. So last year we would have seen uh, seen more in the export side, but this year a bit more in the domestic side of the business. Yeah. Okay. Patty. And does it? Sorry, sorry, Ali. One, one there you go, Patrick. Sorry. And and does it? Um, is it a sort of wait and see for, for how you approach, you know, renewals now compared to four weeks ago? At this point, we haven't changed our approach, Patrick. So obviously, you know, a, a lot of factors go into, you know, the, the pricing and the, and the risk profile of clients. But, you know, we're still looking to support our clients. You know, they've, they've performed well, as I said, over the last 12 months. So we're not, look, not looking to, you know, in, increase premiums um, at present um, and obviously you know when this seminar was arranged and you know everything was everything looked a lot more rosy at um, the 30th of June but from a COFAS perspective obviously you know at our, we're a French headquartered company and, and we have a country you know risk team in based in Paris and, and they based we have um, scoring grids on countries and they've actually just updated Australia so we've gone from an A3 to an A2 so based on the, yeah. the, the strong economic data that they that they see in Australia, um, they think that the market here is is strong and and worthy of an upgrade from an A3. So and that will permeate through our our pricing model and how we look at risk. But obviously, you know, how long's a piece of string in terms of how long this lockdown will be, and obviously, you know, we'll adjust. But you know, always bearing in mind, you know, the needs of our clients and their performance. Um, I'll throw this open to anybody who wants to answer it. Obviously, it is a problem that our borders remain closed and that there does seem to be no um, way forward for us to open our borders. How much of a problem is that for our country? Nerida, I'm going to throw you in there. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a big problem. As, I mean, as if, as you, if you have a look. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you have a look at uh, what happens, what's happening to Melbourne, you know, I, I think, you know, on one hand, it was the extended lockdown, but on the other hand, Melbourne, Melbourne's success has been uh, its ability to to grow in terms of population growth. And if you have a look at Victoria's number one export, it, it is actually education. So, you know, you've cut, you basically cut off. Uh, Victoria's number one export and you've also cut uh, what has been the engine for growth in that state. Uh, you've also got a problem that um, we, we, we've set, we're starting, or we, we did see last year a, a big flow of people out, out of Victoria and, and up north. So, you know, some southeast Queensland saw the highest level of, um, of migration from Melbourne since the early 1990s. So, you know, it, it, it's problematic, particularly for Victoria uh, in the short term. Uh, longer term, uh, it, it's also problematic because um, you have a look at, um, you know, obviously hospitality is shut down at the moment, but prior to this lockdown, if you were in regional Australia and you were operating a cafe, you were probably finding it pretty difficult to get uh, staff. And um, similarly, you know, there's a lot of, um, a lot of, you know, fruit picking is, is another obvious one. You know, there's lots of um, labour that we, we get from overseas and um, skilled labour and also um, not skilled labour and, and that really uh, does, does drive our economy. 
Um, the flow on from that is wage rises. So, you know, we, we do, you know, everyone loves a wage rise. Like, you know, there's no denying that people are, are not going to say no to a wage rise. But at the same time, that does drive inflation. So you then start to see, well, inflation will pick up because they're all, you know, moving quicker and spending more. But inflation will pick up too because people are earning more money. And then for businesses, that's problematic because then their cost of input starts to increase. Um, it's a problematic for, for the inflation target for the reserve banks and then interest rates start to increase. You know, so there's all these flow on effects that um, are stopped to migration can can be quite problematic. And and I think this is the thing with migration, people tend to look at it in a very simple way. Like, oh, the house prices are going up because of migration or, you know, or, you know, it's, I can't find a job because of migration. But, you know, there's so much interconnectedness and there's also interstate and inter intrastate migration, which is, is problematic too. You know, I mean, one of the things um, you know, one of the discussions that I hear a lot about affordability is that, you know, well, Australia would be really affordable if we stop migration and parts of it definitely would be more affordable, but you only have to look at somewhere like Japan where you've got um, places in Japan where people just throw away their keys and walk away from their homes because the homes have no value and they don't want to live in them. Um, but then, then on the other hand, you go to Tokyo and Tokyo's got an affordability problem. So, you know, you can't, you can't so easily just dismiss migration as, as being an integral part of our economic growth as, as easily as saying, it, you know, stop it and, and everything will, will work out a lot better. Thank you. Um, we've got another question this time to Chris. Do you expect a tsunami of businesses simply to give up? due to current business instability and uncertainty to be, to uh, plan for the future? Certainly hope not. That would, be, uh, <laughs> that, would, that would be tsunami, that would mean tsunami of claims. That would never be good. No, uh, no. I, 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 I don't see that mentality being in place and, and just, you know, I think, you know, obviously, you know, there's, there's a bit of pe pessimism around at the moment and you know, in, the, in our discussion today, but I think it should be noted we're coming off a very strong base. You know, the, the macro numbers in 30 June were, were very strong. So, and all the indicators were, you know, similar, you know, pointed to the fact that we were almost in pre-COVID. So I think in, in that respect, you know, there, there's, you know, there's still, you know, COVID permitting and lockdown permitting, which obviously, you know, impacts on people's perceptions. I think we're still in a, in a pretty good place uh, in terms of the, the, the macro economics, I think, you know, Patrick talked about the small government support for New South Wales, and obviously, you know, I'm, I'm sure if it went to a, lock, a longer lockdown, that you know, they would you know, consider something else as well. Um, mm. And also the resilience of business owners. I, I don't see a business owner just throwing away the keys. I think that they would, they would, you know, take every measures that they could to survive. And I think the other thing, you know, worth mentioning is that you know, there's been a been a lot of support from government, but also from the at the ATO and the banks. I think over the last, you know, the last 12, 18 months, which which is a key key factor in in the success. So as long as there's that continued support to some level, I think you know, while the support's there and and there, and people believe that we can come out of the other side, I still think people will, will try and push their businesses through. It's a good question though, because I think now there is this sort of urban myth that you know people survived the first lockdown, maybe the second lockdown, but this third lockdown is just you know too much for them. Um, maybe Jeanette or Patrick, have you? Is that just an urban myth? You know, are people now going to? This is it. This is the final, you know, problem. Are they just going to give up, or is that yeah just an, a myth? Look, I, I think that um, what we have to remember is that the government has been quite interventionalist, as as we said. That you know they 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 have uh, come to the aid of a, of small business. Certainly during the initial stages of the pandemic, they came in, they gave us all the safe harbour measures, they um, told creditors to back off and leave business alone. I mean, I think that there are um, there's no illusions to our federal government that um, small business is the backbone to our country. So I can't imagine now they're going to throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? So they will do what they need to do. And, um, you know, I alluded to it earlier with the earlier indications from the tax office that, you know, there's this, um, you know, we're sending out firm letters to people at the moment from the tax office to collect our debts. We're reminding you that you're indebted to us. We're reminding you to continue to lodge your bazes. We're really focused on 
you being good corporate citizens. And um, you know, in terms of payment, you get to it when you get to it. And, and, we're, and we'll, we'll, we'll park that for a little while and we'll come back to you uh, sometime in the, in the latter part of this year when, you, when you've got your feet back on the ground. And so I think I can't see any um, reason why that would stop now after the, the recent events. And I think banks will be in a, a, a similar um, mindset as well. So, um, yeah, look, I, I think the, the only problem probably is that continued lockdowns hurt our confidence. They hurt our confidence in terms of um, starting new businesses. They hurt our confidence in, in picking yourself back up and, and having another crack. So, um, you know, there is that, that issue, I suppose, at play a little bit here. Mm -hmm. What's your perspective, Patrick? So, uh, yeah, look, it is, I think it is an, a, an urban myth to use that, you know, that terminology. However, it seems to be growing as well. Uh, you hear it a lot more. Um, does come through the media probably more than, you know, talking to business owners. But you, you've also just got to walk around, um, you know, the city and even pre-lockdown, there's a lot of, lot of retail stores and, and um, hospitality venues that, that didn't open back up in, you know, through May and June when the economy was doing really well. And, and the city was busy. I mean, I'm in Sydney. Um, I'm not sure what Melbourne was like, but it, it was busy again. You know, to try to get a booking at a at a restaurant was was very tough. And that's always a really good sign. You know, it felt, it felt like, you know, December, December period, you know, even if you just wanted to go to the local, um, you know, cafe or small restaurant, which, which is great. But there was there was plenty of places that just haven't opened back up, which I think, you know, you've got to, you've got to ask, you know, why and, and, and what will replace that and, and what happened to that company from a, you know, a corporate structure and an and ASIC document perspective. Um, but I think, look, you, you know, we got through, we got through um, what I'd call COVID 1.0. We're probably in COVID <laughs> 2.0 now, given we were back to sort of pre-COVID levels. Um, and, you know, the, the economy was flying and, and we bounced back really well. Um, and, and as Chris made a very good point that, you know, we're coming off a very high base, which is, which is, which is fantastic. And I think, you know, we will get through this, even if it goes on for another two months, um, that there's, there'll be no doubt some challenges in there. Um, the, the one thing that sort of concerns me a bit though, is that, you know, New South Wales certainly did more than its fair share of the heavy lifting over COVID 1.0, you know, in terms of, I would say, you know, GDP growth, getting people back into the country. That's something that really, you know, hurts me as an Aussie to know that there are Aussies that want to come home and they can't. You know, I, I just I have a, a fundamental issue with that. Um, so with with New South Wales particularly going into a, you know, two, three, you know, how, how many ever months um, it'll take, and then and then it doesn't just snap back to where we were. There's obviously a you know sustained opening thereafter. Um, you know what sort of effect that that will have um, on, on, on the economy and confidence and whatnot. We, we don't expect to see a tsunami of, of businesses closing. We've always expected a sort of sustained increase back up to pre-COVID numbers. And that's what we were starting you know, to see over the first sort of six months of, of the year. Um, we'll probably see a, a, a downturn in, in, um, in administrations again, sim similar to you know, uh, the insurance industry seeing you know, fantastic age trial balances and a, and a reduction in claims, you know, it's sort of an upside down world when it comes to stats, but, you know, Jeanette can, can talk to the, the fact that a company going into administration, it, it takes a period of time from a, you know, practicality perspective, the director goes, mm, I'm, I'm doing it tough here, it takes a week or two to book in a time for the, the, to see the accountant, then the accountant looks at the books and comes back to them a week or two later and says, yeah, mm, this doesn't look very good. We should try to do something like, by the time you get to speaking to an insolvency practitioner, what's that, you know, two months, maybe three months, and then there's the documentation side of things. And I think that's why we saw an increase more towards, you know, the middle of this year from JobKeeper coming to an end, um, mm. because it takes time for these things to filter through. And then, of course, you've got the banks and the ATO um, certainly supporting um, businesses more than any other creditor out there. You know, they're responsible for a huge amount of court actions and, and ultimately winding ups and administrations and, and they're certainly not about to uh, undo all the hard work that, 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 that they did and, and the government and, and everyone else in Australia um, over the last 16 months. 
Yes, yeah, it'll be, you know, there's certainly been no moves yet to reintroduce the temporary moratorium on trading while insolvent, but it'll be interesting to see if the government does consider measures like that, if these lockdowns do continue for a prolonged period. Do you have any feeling whether they might have an appetite to reintroduce those sorts of measures? Um, look, I haven't heard anything, but uh, you never know. We, it sort of uh, happened pretty suddenly last time, didn't it? Um, I think the difference today is that uh, surely we've spoken enough about safe harbour now that people know how to access it without it being legislated and uh, just given blanket to everybody in Australia, which is what happened last time for the, for the nine months of um, 2020. So I think that, you know, there'll be other measures that, 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 that they can introduce to assist, but certainly they're not shy of, of uh, playing around with the legislation and they love uh, seeing that Corporations Act grow and grow and grow. So, you know, we've got small business liquidations now, we've got um, small business reconstruction, we've got all sorts of things that we haven't even really accessed or started using in any meaningful way. Um, so there's, there's probably enough there at the moment. I think where there'll be... Uh, where they'll come to the fore is that they'll probably do financial um, uh, incentives instead. There might be some significant changes to tax um, deductibilities and things of that, that nature. I'm, I'm guessing, I don't know, crystal ball. And there's an election coming. Of course. <laughs> Well, that's right. That'll certainly play into whatever the government, the federal government, decides <laughs> to do. Uh, another question for you, Nerida. You mentioned government debt reaching a uh, trillion dollars by 2025. So does the government just keep providing stimulus every time there is a lockdown? What other levers do they have? Yeah, well... I mean, they don't, they don't need to always provide cash, you know, I mean, there are other ways that um, they can help. Um, and I'm trying to think off the top of the head some of these examples, but, you know, for example, planning controls can help the construction industry. You know, you can get the construction sector back up if you, you know, fiddle around with, with what's happening with planning controls. Um, there's a lot that can be done at a local level for areas that have been far more adversely impacted. And, um, you know, you, you only have to look at, you know, City, City of Melbourne, what, what they've been doing. I mean, they've calculated uh, their economic impact, their, the economic impact of the lockdown was um, a 22% drop in their total um, productivity. But, you know, you, you look at what some of the programs that they're introducing in terms of getting people back into the city and, um, you know, they, they're using, utilising the arts, they're utilising sport. Uh, they're, they're taking advantage of vacant shops and, you know, putting, you know, low rent for pop-up shops, those sorts of things. So, you know, there's definitely things that can, can be done at a macro level, but also definitely things that can be done at a state uh, and also a, um, and a, you know, and even a, a city or suburb level. I think the, the big question is, you know, how how do we pay this back? Because at some stage, you know, we, we will need to look very closely at how we get um, this, you know, $1 trillion debt down. And uh, there's still very little discussion about what that could look like. I mean, we, we saw, you know, we started to see a few state budgets come out and, you know, fiddle around with some some tax taxation issues and um, and the like. Uh, but, you know, a, a tax that high probably needs something pretty massive. So, you know, whether it's an increase to the GST, um, you know, there's, I, I don't know exactly, I mean, we don't know, but, you know, I think at some point this is going to become a very big discussion point and will probably start to come about once uh, the majority of people in Australia are vaccinated. Um, here is a question uh, from our own Harley Dale. Patrick makes the point uh, payment times looked better mid-year in Sydney, but many retailers didn't reopen. The size of certain business sectors has shrunk. How much of a problem is that? I, I think, um, look, from my perspective, you know, we, we need to start looking a little bit more granular. You know, there'll be certain industries in specific areas that, are, that really hurt. You know that that's where you can you can bet pretty confidently that there'll be um, you know an increase in administrations or um, delinquencies etc. Um, what, what what I thought was quite interesting was I compared the sort of numbers around you know defaults and, and administrations of 
Victoria in Victoria as a proportion compared to um, the year before. And, and despite the 112 day lockdown, you know, the, the, the increase was like less than 1%, um, which, which, you know, again, you, you, you shake your head surely as a, as, as an economist or a statistician or, you know, an insurer or, you know, uh, an insolvency practitioner and go, oh, how, how does that make sense? And I think it just, it just um, shows how robust, you know, Australia, and its economy is and, and how resilient um, business owners as well. But yeah, to, 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 to Harley's point, I think you need to start looking at um, specific sectors in certain areas um, and, and, and Creditor Watch um, will start to share some of that granular detail uh, in September. We've got a, a new sort of tool that'll be coming out for, for people to use. Um, here's a, 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 you know, it's sort of a fun question. What will uh, the announcement of the of Brisbane getting the Olympics in 2032 mean for business in Australia? Who wants to tackle that one? Well, I've just been looking at the KPMG report, and um, they, uh, I think they were in the bid, so maybe maybe this is a little bit biased, but um, <laughs> they, I think they're looking at around. I'm off the top of my head, I have to look it up, but you know, billions of um, positive social and economic impacts. Um, no doubt, a positive for um, employment over that time period. Definitely a positive for um, tourism, which you know that's a positive. Uh, the GABA is going to get a billion dollar upgrade so you know public infrastructure will have spending uh, you know there's, I, I guess so more broadly there's mixed views as to what economic impact uh, that the Olympics have on a city but you know certainly right now high level it's it is looking um, very very good news for, for the Brisbane economy or, or the southeast Queensland economy more particularly um, here's a, a, a comment more than a question. You have to remember we're in an interconnected community. Support for business in affected areas is great, but we're in Melbourne and since the Sydney lockdown, our turnover has taken a 40% hit. These rolling lockdowns are not sustainable. Um, yeah, that's very interesting, isn't it? That, you know, it's it, you, you might assume that lockdowns would only affect one state, but it really does have an effect across Australia, especially when New South Wales is it such a huge contributor to the national economy. Just just on that point, Ali, the, um, if we jump in there, I suppose you know, we all look at UK now with a lot of interest. Obviously, you know, they have a much higher vaccination rate. They've now made the decision to reopen. Um, despite you know significant cases per day, um, so you know as I said, it, it, it's a, a real test case for us in terms of if we get our vaccination rates to a sufficient amount, would we and could we then reopen despite you know a high level of virus still being in the environment? Um, one uh, another question for you, Chris. How um, uh, will it become more difficult to secure trade credit insurance as? perhaps the economic environment becomes or deteriorates? Uh, historically, you would say yes. So mm -hmm. trade credit insurers um, tend to price accordingly and risk accordingly when there's a high claims environment. So um, it's not to say that it, it's completely off, but obviously you know, if you looked at um, the market last year it was it was a diminished appetite um, obviously it's it's fully open now um, and obviously we always look to the market always looks to support its its clientele um, but you know as I said the, the pricing and, and the and the risk appetite um, will, will reflect the the, the, the basically the, the claims environment I think um, if you look at a risk on risk off environment, it's now a risk on environment. And that's just something that has to be reflected throughout the business community. Yeah. So we're coming up to the end of the hour. And what I'd like to do before we finish is just ask all our panelists to um, perhaps make a comment about how they see uh, the remainder of the year panning out in terms of economic conditions, um, especially given the tricky situation that many states um, now find themselves in. Patrick, what's your view of the future? So at the beginning of the year, I, I, my, my word for the year was positivity and it, and it sounds, uh, sounds, I don't know, a little bit simple at the time, but really last year was so full of negativity, particularly, you know, 
every interview that, that I did, whether it was in the media or, or with, with customers one on one. I'm still I'm still bullish about about this year and especially hearing from, you know, Nerida, Chris and, and Jeanette, you know, with their experience and, and their input. Um, I'm still bullish about it, even even if the Sydney or New South Wales lockdown continues for, you know, another few months. I think we, we've seen that we can bounce back and, and you generally learn from from experiences like that and we'll bounce back quicker and um, uh, in better shape than, than, you know, Victoria, for example, not, it's not a, it's not a Victoria versus New South Wales comment, by the way, it's just, we're learning from your experience. Um, so yeah, look, I'm, I'm quite positive about it. Um, the sooner, the better, obviously I, I just, I can't see it going for, for six months. I just don't think the, uh, the, the governments will sort of allow that to happen. We'll either get more drastic lockdowns, um, in terms of don't leave, you know, outside of the hour or, or more or more stringent than, than what it is it's hard to sort of keep up with all the the uh the, the rules out there or um you know we'll, we'll get to a point where they're they're happy with the vaccination rate and, and they start to let segments of the community back out if they are vaccinated that's right i i like the attitude you can't have a positive outcome unless you have a positive outlook so you may as well have a positive outlook what about you narrator okay. what's your um crystal ball hold yeah look I, I agree with Patrick you know I don't I don't think this lockdown will derail the recovery I mean it, it will it will impact some business types you know without a doubt we can see some geographic areas such as you know inner urban areas do get more impacted uh, there's definitely winners from from lockdown you know you only have to look at you know some industries such as um, mining which have really taken off tech is another one so you know there, there's certainly some winners there as well and um, and, and now as we are, you know, we are becoming vaccinated and I, and I think one of the, the outcomes of this is that it is speeding up the vaccination process and it is making people a lot louder around, you know, how we should be vaccinated far more quickly than we currently have. So, yeah, overall, I'm, I'm very positive. You know, we, we're coming to this very strong. It's, um, it's going to slow things down, particularly in New South Wales. But uh, as we saw in Victoria, um, the economy does bounce back. People are resilient, and um, and and businesses, you know, although they do suffer, many of them do, or most of them do, do recover from from these circumstances. That's great. What about you, Chris? What's your vision of the future? I mean, I'm I'm in the same camp. So obviously, you know, has, you know, optimistic for the for the future. I think you know, um, as we've discussed, you know, the, the macro numbers are good. We've got a good financial structures in Australia to to weather these storms. We've got the the likes of the government, the banks, and ATO support, which which we've had up to now, and I'm sure we'll continue in some guise or another. And obviously, we we have the roadmap out in terms of the the vaccination numbers. So you know, if everyone's on board, um, I'm sure we can come out the other side uh, and return to some kind of normal, whatever that means in a in a in a post COVID world. That's right. Go get your jabs, everybody. What about you, Jeanette? Well, furious agreement, of course, but um, just a, just approaching it from the Queensland perspective, and I feel terrible saying this, of course, because we're not in lockdown, but, you know, it's pretty much business as usual here, and we've just got, um, you know, we have to wear masks outside for another week, and, and that's about it. So, you know, life goes on here. So I, I, I drove past the Gabba this morning, and there's already a lot of work taking place across the road with um, the Cross River Rail Tunnel. So, you know, we've got a lot of activity here in Queensland. So I think, you know, things are in good shape. It's hard not to be positive um, up here. Just the only thing that rocks our confidence occasionally is when you get, you know, oh, there might be a little outbreak here and you just get a little bit nervous. Oh, gosh, don't, don't let us have a lockdown. You know, I've got a conference next week and fingers crossed, you know, we want to have an in-person conference. So, yeah, look, I, I think um, very positive for the, for the future. Well, I'd like to say thanks to everybody this morning, all our speakers and the audience as well. Um, it's been a fantastic discussion and I look forward to joining you next time when we have a Creditor Watch webinar. Thank you, everyone. That was fantastic. Ali, as always, thanks for uh, managing um, us all so well and not letting us uh, speak too long about certain topics. I really appreciate it. Nerida, Chris and Jeanette, 
uh, thank you again for the time that you put into this and um, not just the, today on your side time, but also the time into the, the book the, and Financial UK playbook itself. Um, really appreciate it. There are a few others that are obviously contributed to that and um, I, I will shout them out in time as well. For anyone that hasn't seen it, you can jump on the website. Um, if you scroll down a touch, actually I should be able to show it. Make it a little bit easier. Here we go. There we go, creditorwatch.com.au, scroll down, economic road ahead, click on that, fill in the details and it is all yours. There's a nice little video that uh, myself and Ali did as well. Um, so jump on there if you haven't already downloaded it. Um, it's certainly worthwhile getting your hands on and sharing around. And that's it for today. So thanks everyone as well at home and in offices, depending on which state you're in for joining us. I look forward to the next webinar, which no doubt will be coming along soon. So keep an eye out for it. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye. See you guys. Bye.